Good morning, everyone. I am Navaneet Sri Sanmugam, and I'm a PhD student studying at UNC Charlotte. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about LiDAR and point cloud analysis. So first, when Dr. Chen asked me to do this presentation, I obviously did what everyone else would have done, Google. And then Google has the most obvious result, the Wikipedia page. And that's where I found this little thing. This animation is pretty good representation of what a LiDAR does. So first, it has a LiDAR system. It has a, for now, let's just assume it's a blue box. And it emits laser. And we have a, one moment. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, yeah. Before we continue, has everyone received my email about the links and downloaded Cloud Compare? Okay. So the expansion is light detection and ranging. You could find this expansion a maybe pretty much similar, and have heard it already. Radar. Radar is radio detection and ranging. So. Radar uses a big wavelength as opposed to LiDAR using shorter wavelengths. And the principles are very similar. LiDAR is an optical remote sensing technology. So remote sensing in the sense it could sense from a distance. And optical meaning that it uses light waves. So LiDAR was primarily used to measure distances using pulse laser. Pulsed in a sense like it would be switched on for some time and switched off for some more time. So this shows the electromagnetic spectrum. So we have radio waves, microwaves, and gamma rays. And LiDAR uses these wavelengths. So we have UV, visible light region, and the near IR region. Now, what are the components of a LiDAR? We have a laser source, which produces light. We have a scanner. So scanner can contain motors, mirror, and timing electronics. Laser detector, so to detect the reflected light. 
navigation positioning systems say GPS or inertial me measurement system and a computer. So, again we have this animation. So, what actually happens? We have a laser source here, we have the scanner system which is a rotating mirror and light gets reflected from the surfaces you could see here. So, after it gets reflected it gets direct again by the laser detector and then by measuring the time difference between the emitted light and the receiving light we get the distances. So, one of the very important things when you look at this image is that there is an object in front of part of the wall and, uh, and, uh, and so that object would, would block the light. Okay, so laser only sees the uh, line of sight. So, next we move on to the types of LIDAR. So, LIDAR was first conceptualized in 1960s and then first used in 1970s and in the last 10, 20 years they have been using LIDAR very often. So, first we have range finder under physical process based. Physical process in the sense how the laser it is getting used. So, in range finder we have just a laser source, laser gets reflected back and we measure the time difference and we just have the distance that is what this does. Next we have differential absorption lidar which means we use lidar to again send out a light wave and it gets absorbed by these gases over here. Say for example, greenhouse gases let us take carbon dioxide. We use a wavelength such that it gets absorbed by the gas over here. So, depending on the amount of intensity the uh, reflected wave, uh, reflected wave uh, has, we could measure the concentration of the gas present in the atmosphere. And also we use a wavelength that is not absorbed by the gases and that pretty much uh, using the difference between those two uh, wavelengths uh, intensity we could get the distance to the gases. Next we have Doppler lidar, Doppler lidar uses the Doppler effect which uh, is the frequency shift due to moving objects. So, this can be used to measure velocity of atmospheric aerosol and using that we could measure the wind speed. Depending on the scattering type we have 4 more lidars. So, which is MIE scattering, Rayleigh scattering, Raman scattering and fluorescent scattering. So, these are used in their respective uses say for example, this here is normal reflection, the differential absorption lidar probably uses the MIE scattering. Now, Depending on platform, we have a uh, space based lidar, which is the ISAT 2 satellite, 
So this was uh, launched by NASA on September 15th and they use a high uh, powerful laser to measure the ice caps, clouds and land, land elevation. Airborne lidars, we have lidars attached to drones, planes and helicopters. So the drones or planes usually have positioning system using GPS. In this image here we have two GPS satellites and one GPS base station for triangulation and the inertia measurement system which captures the roll, pitch and yaw and we have the uh, laser system scanning in a zigzag manner. Why we need this zigzag manner is because to get a more overlap between scans so that uh, we could attach them later on. Now this poster is an example of how airborne systems can be used. Say uh, this flight through company in UK has this uh, LIDAR attached to a plane which has a uh, thousand feet altitude and it can cover uh, seven to eight kilometers square per hour. We have a fixed wing UAV which flies at 200 feet altitude and we have a mini rotor UAV which flies at 120 feet altitude. So these can cover less or more area depending on what use we need them for. Say for example, if we are interested in just the elevation of uh, landform, we could use this one or if you are more interested in what types of trees and vegetation uh, we have, we could use a lower altitude which means we have more points per area. Next we have terrestrial mobile lidars. So these are usually attached to self-moving cars and also used to analyze infrastructure, power lines and buildings. We also have the stationary lidar which is usually mounted on a tripod and these can be used to uh, scan uh, buildings interior of buildings. Now how much area can a LIDAR cover? So uh, I take uh, Faro as an example, Faro is a LIDAR manufacturer and uh, for our scans we use uh, Faro scanners, so I got this example. So we have mirror here which covers a 300 degree angle in this vertical plane and the LIDAR scanner itself can rotate 360 degrees. So we get a partial sphere of 300 degrees in this direction and 360 degrees in this direction. Now what can a LIDAR measure? Basically it can measure anything or detect anything which has a size greater than or equal to the wavelength size. In our ferro scanners we use 1550 nanometer wavelength for the lasers, so we can measure anything greater than or equal to that. So the wavelength also decides the range of the lidar, lower the wavelength the higher it gets scattered, so we have a limited range. So if we use a higher wavelength lidar then we could measure a higher range. There are a lot of applications for LIDARs, so uh, there are websites showing like uh, 50 applications, 100 applications. So I just put together some of those. Micro topography of objects to find the surface roughness and the like, agriculture 
say for example if a farmer used a different agricultural practice on two parts of his farm and wants to quantify how much it has helped or how much it has not helped so he can use lidar to scan his entire farm and find where if where uh, where his practice worked or not worked forest management so uh, lidar can be used to count number of trees and uh, if a forest fire happens what is the extent of damage and again environmental assessment flood model pollution model we can use different types of lidar for that and forensics so uh, lidar captures the point clouds so this can be used to effectively capture a crime scene so here in this picture we can see policemen uh, using a lidar to capture this accident now civil engineering applications what can uh, where can lidar be used we have uh, landslide analysis glacier movement and thickness which is basically what the icesat satellite does uh, urban utility planning we have Uh, electric grid mapping and monitor sagging we can also do earthquake damage assessment so uh, capture a building before earthquake hits and what is its condition after an earthquake lidar can also be used in bridge inspection and that is what we do so a uh, lidar can be used uh, for clearance inspection surface defect quantification displacement measurement last impact monitoring and static load test now this here is so this is a uh, scanned image of a bridge and this is visualized using cloud compare so the scanner actually placed on this position so it scans the first image or first surface it the laser could could hit so these are actually the underneath of the bridge so you can actually go back and trace where you put the laser because from what the navigator was showing before if the laser is on the side part the only place that you cannot see is right underneath So there is always a circle of shadow. I mean, right. yeah. This yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we have more images. Yeah. Oh, oh, go back, go back. So you can see many, many things from this one picture. For example, you see the column, right? The bridge here. But behind it seems like shadow. Those are actually because the column is blocked. So it's not true shadow. the part of the behind the column of the laser camera so it appears like the right now yes yeah you can yeah we yeah, yeah. see so, uh, how we do that is like uh, let's say this is the scan of a bridge without any loading and let's say we load the bridge and then we scan again so we could measure the difference between the two and then use it no no it's just the surface required resolutions for remote sensing imagery this is an estimate of what resolution a, a remote scanner should have to capture these kind of cases let's say so uh, if we have a missing railing we should have a, a resolution of 0.5 meters or uh, if if there is a chemical if there is a chemical spill then uh, what would be what would be physically observed is probably discoloring and we should have a 0.1 meter resolution to capture that uh 
uh, resolution of the scanner required. This is just an estimate. Yeah. Now, why do we need LiDAR or what are the advantages of using LiDAR? Now, it has a large coverage area, easy data collection. So, uh, you just uh, set the required parameters on the instrument and then it scans for points. Uh, the time could take somewhere like uh, from 2 minutes to 2 hours depending on what exactly uh, you require. We have large amount of information and evaluation is repeatable. So, we could run the LiDAR again and again. Can be used in darkness. So, it does not depend on sunlight. So, it can be used in darkness. It is more accurate than visual inspection. Now, what does a LiDAR give us? What is its output? So, basically I can say that it gives out a point cloud. What is a point cloud? Point cloud is a set of points and what is a point is basically x, y, z coordinates. A LiDAR also gives us an intensity map. So, it depends on the reflection, reflectivity of a surface. So, intensity can be a single value or RGB values with RGB values equal. So, uh, you could try this out yourself. If you go to Google and say uh, color picker and set RGB values, you could find out what color each combination gives. And if you have R equal to G equal to B, that means uh, all th oh, oh, I'm sorry, all three are equal, then you would always have a shade of black. So, 0, 0, 0 gives white, 255, 255, 255 gives black and anywhere in between it is black to white. And this is few rows of data from uh, a laser scan. We have x coordinates, y coordinates, z coordinates and RGB values. Now, these two are some somewhat added after the scan, so that uh, we could process the data easily. So, editing data is also possible. Bridge clearance measurement. Now, the, we are coming back to the bridge inspection applications. So, now we have this bridge and we have scanned using LiDAR and bridge clearance is basically the distance between the top surface and bottom surface. What is the maximum height a vehicle can be allowed so that it could pass through without any obstruction? So when you Thing is, you notice that in this picture there are a lot of vertical lines, okay? 
those are actually cost cutting by Okay, so the laser scan, as uh, Nevani was describing, is a mechanical device that rotates the laser beam. Okay, it's an optical instrument. But because it has a certain speed of rotation, okay, so when cars going by at a certain speed, you will not see the entire car. It's not fast enough. So it all captures one line on that car. Okay, and that's why you see so many lines. So if you have many lines, that means you have a very big capacity. I mean, you can do it. But if you have so a few more or less lines, that means you have less capacity. Okay, but when a car goes by, as you can see, you will go in a little speaker of the line. Oh, you will not see the vehicle if you want to go to the vehicle. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. You can artificially remove those lines. But that means you, you are assuming what is behind. But even if we remove all those data, we would still not get what's behind it. Because LIDAR didn't actually measure. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. So if you remove that uh, line, you get a black line. Yeah. yeah. If you remove that line, all the Next we have bridge surface defect quantification. So surface defects can be a loss of mass or uh, corroded parts. So in this image we have some defective area over here. So what we do is cut out that portion, define a reference plane so that we could actually measure or calculate what the defective area and defective volume is. So that is what is being done here. We just cut out this portion. This is the reference plane and then calculate the area and volume. Now you have to remember the, the defective area compared to the entire thing is very small. Okay, and that's why it looks like you have a two-dimensional uh, plane with some colors. But in reality, it's a very, very thick component. Okay, and you actually have a, uh, a, a very well-defined surface. On, on that. Okay. No, here's another very important point. So you will have to be very good with the geometry. There are some damage that is contained. There are some damage that is what is convex, right? And so contained, when you uh, use a laser scan, always remember it's, you're seeing a line, okay? So if you have two feet of hole, you will not see the entire mm -hmm. hole, right? Because the edge of the boundary is blocked, is blue, okay, or something. But if you have a contained, I mean a convex surface, Okay. Then, such as if a chunk of concrete drop on the ground in the base part, and then you want to make out what is the volume of that. Then, when you, however you scan, unless you scan for many, many things, you cannot get it to in the volume of that, that subject. Does that make sense? Because you will not see other things. Like a cube, you always only see two sides, never all the This is a close-up of the previous image. We have defective areas and then again the reference plane and the quantification. Bridge displacement detection. Uh, so for this we have... Yeah. So this is a highway bridge over highway bridge. Okay. I mean over highway lane. And then we use a uh, static load test. Okay, so we have to take truck. In 2014, we did similar test on the bridge with the airport. Yeah, I am aware. Right, right. But if we had laser, then you'll be able to do the test much easier. Because 
that calls the people to the big job we need. Stop the traffic so that we wait, uh, we let the static self wave of uh, deflection. And then we pass the big truck and pulse at different positions so that we can create different deflections. And then we can send the data. And for those, uh, especially Harlan and Barbie, uh, they're all part of the original team and this is the first team. They understand the difficulty, okay, because, and I'll show some pictures from them, because if you, the alternative, what we are doing today, you have to create a scaffold underneath the bridge, and then put gouges underneath, you know, contacting with the bridge set, so that when you put the trucks, the, the gouges will match the bridge. It's a long process. You have to stop the traffic in, in order to build the scaffold. This is a much better alternative. So this is the aerial of that same bridge. Uh, we fly over to show you we stop the traffic with a brand new bridge. And then we bring the truck in at a different location, kind of like when you do the static mode design of the maximum moment point. And that's the side of the bridge. Yes, yeah. yeah. No, the, the bottom <laughs> heavy is going. The top heavy is soft. So that's another thing. Right, yeah. And we were lucky last time when we were testing the bridge with the overall on the top, on the top. Yeah, but not the railway. Oh, the railway would be that thing. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Wow, I'll get the addition by now. Depends. Yeah. That, it, that's a very good question because theoretically, yes, the laser beam can go straight into your crust and then you, you make it through. But then remember, this laser is moving. Okay, it's getting stuck between. So you may miss your crust. Yeah, if you make it stop at that point, yes. They qualify. If your crash goes like this, you will not. But if it's a space, it's a crash. Yeah. This was the uh, result of the static load test. We have the difference from the LiDAR deflection and we have the FVM model. And these were the results. So from LiDAR deflection, we get uh, 0.663 inches. From FEM calculations, we get 0.605 inches. And LiDAR resolution was uh, 0.12 inches. That equates to about uh, 3 millimeters. And these were the position of these trucks used in the test. Now, uh, LiDAR images, uh, LiDAR scans of bridges. So the rest of uh, rest would be some examples. So we have uh, this. This is a bridge over what? Yes. You could see that uh, a lot of these scans are missing. So we basically cut out uh, vegetation. We cut out uh, yeah. So that we could press, uh, so that we could make it look like a bridge. Now this is one of the original scans, so without any editing. So we have underneath of the bridge surface, we have trees, 
we have people we have people working in the water yep because they move very slow yeah yeah but if one line they were actually measuring the depth of the uh, river yeah 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 so that's why we have <laughs> yeah over here so for construction of management purposes you know you can even use this for seeing analysis you know what are the people doing at different locations you know somebody usually doing something so you know like the city oh absolutely yeah and even better than the city this time because you know how far away <laughs> no, sometimes we do get clear faces yeah, yeah. if they are standing still for a long enough time so that the lidar scan can enter. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The, the spatial, yeah. the point to point resolution change. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. But this is our our distance is what 300. Uh, 350 meters. Yeah. That was the maximum range. Yeah. So yeah. And you can So some more points to note here would be the shadows, if you can say it like that. So the LIDAR was kept somewhere in this position. So the laser cannot scan what's behind here. It also does not scan. Yes. Yeah, this is the underneath of the bridge. And then we have shadows from the piers, shadows from vegetation. So we cannot get the entire scan or a complete picture using a single scan. So we need to scan multiple times. Yes, yes, definitely, yes. Yes. Actually, that technology, I don't see it another way, but now it is really good. I will show you some pictures, well, I'm not today, but um, in the old days, when we scanned it, old days, when we scanned it, old days, when we we had to put hardware. So when you scan one point, another point, another point, another point, you need to have it to break the image. Okay, because that's a But now the automation on the software yes. is without the targets. I don't understand how they can be very good. They actually recommend uh, more than 20% of overlap. Say, uh, if I have a LiDAR over here and scan this monitor, and LiDAR over there, this common surface should be 20% of the total number of points. Yep. Yes, stitching, exactly. Yep. Yep. So we have another scan of a different bridge. Uh, you could actually tell the position of the uh, LIDAR from the shadows. So intersection of these two points somewhere over here. And we have a lot of trees as well. I noticed that the trees look like they were projecting away, and that is because the laser beams are going away from the target. So when you scan the trees, it <coughs> looks like you know, somebody is spraying the leaves. This is a scan of another bridge, and we have the LIDAR position here. Uh, you could clearly see in this that it doesn't scan what's underneath yeah. the LiDAR itself. So we have... Notice that all the conductors are left and Yeah. What happened to the beams that got cut off? 
the peer over here. Yeah. Shadow, shadow of the peer. So we don't get what's in this region. For our case, uh, that is bridge inspection. What we want to see is only the bridge. So the trees, the uh, transmission lines are all noise. This is another bridge and we have the LiDAR here. So it scanned only the underneath for this region. The others are all shadows. So we have steps and steps of bridge slabs. In this image, the LiDAR is here. We can see trees. We can see, again, transmission lines. The underneath of the bridge, the side of the bridge, and we have shadows due to this pier. Now, uh, another thing that is very critical, and you know, just for full disclosure to the faculty, um, we are right, right now doing another project, scanning the first uh, hour of the house. Okay. Now, then it becomes very important to be able to see underneath the world. Now, as uh, Melanie was talking about early on, every laser has only a narrow bandwidth, so from infrared all the way to ultraviolet. Yeah. Okay. And so, how can you see underneath the water? You have to choose the laser wavelength that can penetrate into the water so you can see the bottom of it. These are technologies that they can achieve five years ago. So now, there are some lasers that have low band things. One sees underneath the water, one sees above, because you need two different ways now. But uh, depends on what laser you use. First, sometimes the, the river water looks different. Even then, uh, those are not very accurate because the water keeps moving in this place. So the due to height difference, the refraction would get different values each time it scans. So those are problems. Now this is a photograph of this bridge. So this is how the underneath looks. Now this case was a bit special because the water level was so low we were able to see the uh, sandy surface in the scan. So that was. Mm. Now what are the disadvantages of LiDAR? So we can use LiDAR for many, many applications. Now what are the dis disadvantages? So it scans only the surface. It cannot go underneath a surface. Multiple scans are required to get a complete picture. So because we have shadows, if we want to get a complete picture, we have to scan one underneath and one maybe on the other side of the bridge and maybe even two more, yes. So even then, uh, it is difficult to say we get a complete picture because there would always be uh, places where we cannot access due to physical constraints or too much vegetation. So vegetation would always obstruct the LiDAR lasers. large amount of data. You could note that large amount of data was also in the advantages section of LiDAR. The large amount of data is also disadvantaged because we need a lot of time to process all the data. Getting the data is very simple, like it takes just minutes to hours, but processing data takes a very long time. If you do not have a, a specific computer systems, then it could take probably a day or so. Less effective during rains. 
So, the LiDAR system itself, the uh, what we have, uh, uh, what new LiDAR systems we have, they are waterproof. So, they can technically work in rain, but it is less effective due to being refraction from raindrops. So, we do not get accurate data. Next we go to the So next we go to a little bit about uh, point cloud processing. So you have all downloaded and installed Cloud Compare, yes. Yep. Okay. So uh, when you open Cloud Compare, uh, you would get this screen. So uh, the first menu is file, edit, tools, display, plugins, 3D views and help. So whatever shortcut tools you have here, everything can be found in the main menu itself. This is the main toolbar. You could open, save, pick points, delete. I will just say a few frequently used uh, tools and then we will move on. Scala field toolbar, uh, we will not use it this time. Plugins toolbar as well. View toolbar is here on the left. So we can use this to see in different views, say uh, left view or right view, bottom view. Database tree, it shows what files you have opened and what dependencies it can have. Properties of your selected database. This is the default view if you open a file in Cloud Compare. You could also set another view if you want it. And 10 is the console. Uh, console usually uh, tells you if there is any error or what it is doing right now. So you could view the status over there. Uh, okay, so this is unrelated, but uh, it is a cartoon character from a music video. Yeah, desktop image. Okay, okay. Oh, that sounds uh, uh, <laughs> no.
No, it is a separate software developed by uh, yeah, another, yeah, it is open source, we could download, yeah. So please open this uh, file in Cloud Compare that I have sent you. So when you open it, it will ask for your instruction. So the data has six columns in it and it will ask you what those columns exactly are. Sometimes your data may not be arranged in this format XYZ and RGB. So you get to choose what the data is. So in this case, it is okay. So this is X, this is Y and this is Z and these three are RGB. So you do not need to change anything. Uh, that depends on LiDAR itself. So yeah, position. Position of the. No. Uh, Uh, yes. Yep. Yes. Sometimes the uh, data can actually have GPS coordinates directly. Yeah. So you would actually not have any 000. zero, zero. So it will uh, directly have GPS coordinates. Sometimes the data can have column headers in case uh, showing you this is x coordinate, y coordinate and z coordinate and you could skip those lines using this option. So I could skip number of lines if you have any headers. Press apply and this would open. If the coordinates are very big, then you may get this screen, global shift and scale. So in this example, they have x coordinate as this big of a number and y coordinate as this. So the cloud compare would automatically suggest you to shift the coordinates so that we work with smaller numbers. So what are the advantages is that it saves memory and faster processing. Yes, yes. No. Yeah, it is just translating, translating. If you want to scale, you could also scale. Like if there are uh, too many datas and No, no, no. no. You're not the model. You're just Shifting. So in this case, all our points were smaller numbers, so it didn't actually ask for it. Well, uh, it would automatically suggest you, but. Yeah, if you want to, you can do it. It's it's optional. But uh, cloud compare may lose some of your data if coordinates are too big because memory issues. Yeah. Uh, th these are all editable, so you could change whatever you are comfortable with. Now display. So we have left click. Left click with to rotate the data. So this is actually a, a cut portion of a tunnel scan. So this is it. You could yeah. We can use right click to um, I'm not sure. 
right click to translate it. Yes. Okay. So we try to find out. Ten meters, ten and a half meters, approximately. Ten and a half meters. Yes, yes, we will get to that in some time. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we have left click and right click, mouse wheel to zoom in and out. So we have mouse wheel, and you can use view toolbar to view in, say, top view or side view, left side, back, various other views, database tree, so all loaded entries are stored here, some entries can depend on others, so this is the database tree, now what we have loaded is just one which is 117tunnelcut.xyz. So, under that we only have this cloud. So, for now this is our database tree. We can use right click to uh, delete it or toggle visibility. So, in case you have loaded so many points and you have to you have trouble finding out where each cloud is, you could use this. Now, segmentation. So, we could use segmentation to cut what we do not want or cut what we just want. First, you have to select the cloud and then go to edit segment. And it asks me for uh, contour points. So, if I want to say cut this portion out, I just use left click to select this portion and right click to exit and I could say if I want to segment in or segment out. For now, I am selecting segment in, you could play around with it later. So, I just have this portion. And if I click OK, we now have different database tree. So we have what is remaining and then what is segmented. This is remaining and this is what we have cut out. If you want to just work with what we wanted, uh, you you are free to delete this. So, press this, click this and press delete, so that you save memory. In case you are working with larger files, this would free up most of your memory. So, file formats we use are FLS, TXT and XYZ. FLS is the uh, Pharos file format, TXT and XYZ are ASCII file formats. Now, I delete the entire thing to open it again, apply. So, to find the distance between two points, we have to select what point cloud again and I select point picking. So, point picking would give you point information distance between two points, angle between three points. So, if I click this, I will open this menu and this menu will give me the properties of one point. 
and this would give me distance between two points. This would give me an angle. So if I want the distance, I select this option. I choose a point here and it says it is point number 290906 and So this gives me the distance. The units are in meters, so this is 10.9 meters now. So, cloud compare resources, you could go to this main Wikipedia cloud compare website to get all the information you would need. Are there any questions for using cloud compare? Yes, no. Find the dimensions. Okay, uh, click the cloud. Point picking, distance, and select two points. Yes. So, arc trees are how cloud compare process things. So, let us do this. Okay, the file is so small that it is actually using just one. I will open this one. This is the problem with large data, we have a lot of time. So, I am loading a scan which has about 40 million points. And this would be the scan you would all be using for your homework as well. So, these are what the arc trees are. First, okay.
level 0 it says one cell which is basically the entire scan in one cell level 1 8 cells so it divides the one single block into 8 blocks and then it goes down again into 8 8 8, eight blocks and 8 blocks again and again and again if there are no points then that block could be ignored so you will have less number of cells so 8 times 8 would be 64 but we have just 18 cells so so and then you would keep dividing until it could until we uh, it is comfortable enough to work with it Now this tool here picks the rotation center, so if you are not comfortable with the automatic selection one, you could pick this and click on a point. Okay, this is a better view. So you can see a damage here. Homework. So I'll give out the homework now. Pass it out. the other side. So I will share with you guys this point cloud and you will need to do whatever is in the sheet given to you. The homework is due on next 18, 18th. It is due on the 18th. Any questions? Yeah, the, uh, the, so going through the homework problem, it's uh, open-ended. We ask you some basic questions, really, just to you know, give you the real problem here. That's the purpose. But uh, we wanted you to be able to also think about. So here I have already shown you the operation that has damage. So it's a forensic. What do you need to do when you do an investment? Can you quantify how much is the damage? And how do you, how do, you do that? And then the other 
Yeah, you're trying to pick the points. You could take screenshots, put them in a Word file, and then send it to me. No. Yeah, that that would work. Camera icon is the settings. This one. Oh, oh. Settings, I guess. Yeah, this this is setting is actually reference. Remember that uh, the point cloud actually has the camera, so the metadata of the every point cloud actually remembers where you hit the shot. So that camera is actually the laser. Okay, so you can change the perspective of your laser setting. Okay, so that you can transform your data to whatever light.
three minutes. It is called photogrammetry yeah. and structure from motion. Yeah, yeah that is what so it is called. Yeah, they generate. Like, uh, let's take this table. We take photographs from different angles, combine all those photos to get a 3D model of the table, and then we point get the point cloud. No, no, no. no they from the photo, they generate points. Yeah. Yeah. They generate dots. Yeah. Because when you have a 3D photo, you also know this. Yeah, I think it's because the picture, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. From the picture, right. From the yeah. pixel, yeah. they generate dots. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, when you have point clouds, any other questions? So these are very, very powerful tools, but uh, we are still exploring how to spend the best benefits of this kind of technology. Okay. And it's been used for forensic. Okay, so we have many of my colleagues in the US. They actually do mostly on new construction. So after you construct it, they will take the light on and then you can see the image of the table. You set it and off. And then, you know, they can quantify it. If you construct the building, you can actually see the width, length, height, all that you have to mentally control. Including, you know, if you have a uh, new power, you know, they can tell you how much they are in the So those are the current forensic work that people are doing. And then, uh, Disaster. So a lot of people are dealing with post, post earthquake and other disasters. So there are a lot of aspects. Of that. Any other questions? Oh, yes, yes. But uh, okay. So we have to go into a little bit deeper. Okay. When you generate a laser beam, okay, uh, there are multiple optical arrangements. Okay, so laser beam, you have to 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 set the maximum distance. You have to reduce shrink the beam down to one single stop. Okay, but that optic arrangement is very difficult. Okay. Okay. So now miniaturization were able to uh, reduce that. Uh, so, yeah, so we have a single, say, zoom. Yeah. Like, like a focus. Yeah, it is a focus, but you would still have some amount of divergence on the beam. Yeah. So, if we, if we have more distance and more range, then we have uh, more distance between the points. Yeah, but, but for the, the technology that we have, we have a Yeah, so it is completely wet. It is like literally covered by water. 
And I'll maybe go around if you have any questions on these cloud computers. So this one actually takes the point cloud, takes the reference as well. This is actually the point cloud. This is the reference plane. Yeah, so in this algorithm, you have to be able to define a, a, a circle, okay, for that damage. Because when you look at point clouds, the, the point cloud is like a piece of paper. But 
right now this region. So the whole green type ground is the desert. Okay. So, and, and you can imagine, if you define it closer, smaller volume, further, higher volume. So, you know, where, you know, a lot of detail in our office is, you know, we can do the, uh, the most of the So we have a little bit of automation in here. You can see that by different colors, meaning, you know, the, the surface turn. I, I guess that's translating the surface uh, location, right? Uh, no, uh, the distance between, the Z distance. Yeah, right? yeah, the, between the, the highest point of the surface and to the, the, the reference point. Okay, so if you, if you vary that, you get, you get different companies on area and volume. And that, that is extremely important. So, you know, uh, at some point, I believe we were optimized. Like, you know, you go all the way from 0.05 to 0.024 of different services. Yep. Depends on, you know, so which value to give to becomes a critical factor. Well, in this case, really, because this is what the algorithm. So, you know, that, that tolerance, unless you have many examples that you can evaluate, yeah. We actually had this one slide, but we have to remove it because it was not actually compatible with the newer slider data. So uh, it actually calculates the optimal reference plane from the data itself, so using the least square method. Okay. So uh, let's say. Uh, but I don't exactly understand what you're saying, no, no, uh, but this is an image, right? We have the coordinates. Yes. And suppose, like, what we do in some cases, that we try to overlap one image with the other, and if, if it has to no, be no, done, oh, please wait, please the wait. reference should be the same. Uh, wh what do you mean by overlapping? So kind of like putting one over the other. Time-based. Okay, okay. Not exactly time-based. Let's say you have a landscape. Using this program or using cloud? Or yes, you could uh, overlap them both and then make a difference between what has changed to find out what has changed. That is possible. But in this program, 
what we find is the damage at a particular spot. Mm -hmm. So if we have damage in this section of a bridge, you cut this out and then take that limited portion and then input it into that software. So yeah, yeah it won't take in this entire mm -hmm. bridge assay. Yeah. Okay, so, so the, um, the, the challenge is uh, many codes, okay? What Namini is saying is, you have your bridge there, you damage the bridge, right? You, you have to isolate all the millennium of the bridge so that you cut out this section, so your data looks like this. Because uh, this plan is typically secure, right? So, this algorithm, this particular algorithm that we do, you have to have a reference plan, okay? And uh, you don't know where that reference plan is. It could be here, could be here, could be here, could be here, because ideally, these two points are not even making a sense. And, and you have to remember, when you do calculate uh, out of programming, you have to stop. You know, so that's why in this particular technique, the disadvantage is you have to have a reference plan, but you don't know what that reference plan is. Okay? That's why we have the tolerance. So you go from here to here, remove the plan, and then I think you take that already you have. So that, that's one, one challenge. Uh, the other challenge is really, if you have a curved beam, and then your damage is here, then you assume your space. You know, there is inherent, there is already something in this, you know, and so how, how do you address this? You have to almost have a pre-knowledge that there should be a curve, curve record on this particular. And then how big, how wide, you know? So the challenge is how, how do you ultimately this problem? So people can, you know, the damage can be problematic. Yeah, that's what I think. Yeah. Yeah. The challenge with laser is you always have artifacts. You know, the wind blows, the trees moving, so you get two continuous scans. You know, suddenly the trees are different spots and stuff. You know, unless you can track every leaf on that tree to know that, hey, this is the same leaf that moves. Otherwise, you just get a lot of noise. I want to show something which was not intended for this. Here, here, here. Oh, okay. This file? Yeah. Uh, I'll wait for it to uh, use that. Okay. But this is, this, the, the, the reference plan is just, if you go into studying damage assessment using point cloud, there are many counties. This is just one. Okay. And, and uh, not necessarily the best. Okay. There are other things. And then we also have another program that automatically calculates the And it's good to show you Yeah, that actually needs the top surface of the bridge and, and the bottom, bottom surface. surface. You have to separately clip out the top surface and the bottom surface yeah. and then put it in the program to get the data. Okay, uh, and I, I just wanted to show something from tomorrow's. Uh, Presentation for Nisha. Do you have it again? Yeah. 
Oh, so this this is what I was talking about. So this is what we did in 2014. Yeah, you can see that you we have to wait for people to build that scaffold so people can climb up there and then on the very top. We put a dog gauge, okay, and I, I remember Harriet had to climb up there and do the measurement. And uh, so you can imagine this is a very tedious and challenging task, okay. And uh, I want to show you a stitched together point cloud. So this is one of the case studies I will discuss in class. It's a sports track, but built on a slope. So they have a big retaining wall, and then that retaining wall is moving, okay? And so we go out there and use laser scan. So this is the aerial view of the sports complex, the track and field. Uh, this, the low point, this is the high point of the slope, okay? And so the retaining wall is on, on this side, okay? This is a stitch together, I think 15 scans, we did 15 scans, you know, we moved the laser from point. And this is our low old scanner. I think our old scanner is 100 meter resolution, okay? Using the new scanners, 300 meters, you will have, we need to scan less, okay? This one is 100 scan. And uh, what you see here is, you can actually see the high resolution points are where our laser was. Okay, so you can see where we, we, we put the lasers, okay? You, you could not see the laser that we scan down here. So the 15 is, I think, eight on the top and then seven on the bottom, okay? And, uh, but when we stitch the images together, you can see you have a 3D image of that entire retaining shape, okay? Many, many things you have to be on the watch out. So this, this scattering, you know, it shows you the change in resolution as you go beyond, okay? And that effect is also coupled because you are taking two scans and then trying to stitch them together. So they have to calculate the in-between points and then as a result, you, you reduce resolution as you, you know, and then you see that circular shape of shadow. Okay, the, the moray almost like moray, but it's not moray. Okay, so this, this also li adds to another level of complexity. In other words, you may be quantifying damage using the same methods for this part, spot, that spot, but because of the distance from the laser scan, your resolution is different, so your error will also change. Okay, so you don't always get the exact values, okay. And this is an uh, even older scanner. So this is a work I, done, I did in China. And uh, we couldn't bring the laser to China. So they have their own Chinese-made laser system, okay? And at that time, to generate, so this, this image shows you how poor the quality of the scan is, okay? So it used a medical triangulation. Uh, it's not a real laser scanner. What it does is it has two CCD camera, uh, I think maybe high resolution, and then they have a strong light beam from the middle, okay? And actually that light was so strong, my, uh, my regular camera that I brought with me to take pictures was damaged because of that reflected light, okay? So yeah, when, when the light, you know, you have to wear glasses, otherwise you, yeah, it hurts your eye. But then you, this, this, Oh, I'm getting wrong. This image shows you how poor the quality of the skin, okay? This is the same image, similar image that we see when the other team using camera to do the wrong about shooting of a structure. And then generate the point cloud, okay? And uh, when we do this job, we have to use targets, many, many targets, in order to, to create reference for multiple scan points. Okay, so, so this shows you, you know, the, the different aspects of uh, scanning technology. This was work maybe done more than 10 years ago. So the technology has advanced. Now we don't need those targets. We can just go and do the scan. 
Okay, but at that time you do need this target for uh, reference. Yeah, this is the Chinese uh, technology. Okay, so you have this strong beam in the in the middle, and then one, two. I think there's another camera underneath. So they use a method called triangulation. Instead of taking a camera and move around, they shooting three camera at the same object, and then use three different images to generate the, the pixels to generate the point cloud by algorithm. Okay, so so these are are the things that uh, is challenging to do. Okay, and uh, ah, this is something that we did. Tomorrow I'll elaborate more, but somebody asked, can you see inside of a structure? No, laser only see the surface. Okay, but we are always interested in the inside, right? So this is actually a study we use a ultrasound equivalent technology that looks inside the material and I'm trying to combine with the outside image. So we use a laser to scan this plate, and then we introduce damage, okay, by doing a soil cut, and that creates a stress release, okay, and then we bend the plate, and then we combine the uh, laser with the ultrasound scanning, okay, and then you get this really, really cool images, like this. Okay, so you literally can can see when we do the saw cut, the deeper you go, that red zone would actually move down because it, it points at your crack tip. Okay, and because that's where the stress release is, right? So that's why you have that red color. But that was that was from the um, laser scan. Okay, and then you combine with three D. Now you can literally see the surface transformation with the the inside damage combined image. Now, what is the significance of this work? Unfortunately, we did not continue on this work, but this will transform mechanics as we know it, okay? All of you have basic uh, mechanics of solids, and, and I don't know if you have advanced stress analysis, but we define, remember our discussion, what do we really measure? So even in engineering mechanics, okay? Stress is derived from deformation, the strain field, right? So you, if you, you all should remember, even in finite element, compatibility, equilibrium conditions, the constitutional matrix and all that, all of that is just hypothetical, okay? We learn the theory, okay? But we never see stress. This is the only method that I can think of that can actually project stress. Now you can, compare stress and strain and not assuming that they are always linear. You know, that's that's what the significance of this particular area of work. This is when we bend it and you can see suddenly the stress change direction because using ultrasound, the stress you measure is really relative stress. Okay. Uh, yeah, so this is, this is all the work that we have done in, in this area. And we, in the past, we also try, uh, even here, so this the, this picture is really cool. So we're trying to do the uh, 3D photography, and uh, I don't know how many of you know what this is. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, this is your campus. Does it work? Preview, press preview, yeah. Okay. No. no uh, so we do need the multimedia data. Okay. Yeah. So tomorrow I will show this, but but this is a technique when we were in the Philippines. You know, because we we have so many stand structures. You know, if you just look at a crack, you see the picture, you will forget what that crack is from. You know, which side of the wall. So we use the camera and then we walk around the room and then generate three D images.
We are actually stitching the sets of photos using this method. Yeah, yeah. So using I the uh, structure of promotion. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the other group, is they are trying to generate the point cloud. For this? Yeah, from this thing. So at this time, we don't. At this, when I do this work in 2014, before I come to my, my prolonged sabbatical, uh, and at that time, you cannot generate point cloud from the public. So last year when we when we all project started and I went, I realized that this is a big possibility. I'm like, wow. You know, we have to learn that technique as well. But the resolution like my other pictures is no comparison to it. Okay, that's all we have today. So please uh you also have never been speaking out I'm referencing all of the any challenges, any questions you have to point out how to share any of your homework? Ask. Okay. We're here to help you learn. Okay. So any questions?